right? So uh, I fell in love with watching the wheel spin and this idea of clay as a medium and started to, in my 14-year-old teenage rebellion, right, uh, kind of move away from working for Patricia. And she very much saw clay, I don't think she'd like me saying this on film, but um, <laughs> she saw clay as a lesser material, right, a lesser activity. So this was, this was me rebelling, deciding to go to ceramics. I worked for both of them for a year. I overlapped the two studios, and that was really difficult, uh, having that demand happen in both places. And uh, Terry was easier to work for. Uh, Patricia was really demanding. There was a lot of discipline in the studio. She had really high expectations for what needed to happen. And and that was very good for me, but I needed a break, right? I needed, I needed like a goofy dad. And that's who Terry was. He was a, a new uh, empty nester. His son had just gone to college. I'm only four years younger than his son. So it was kind of perfect timing for him to sort of adopt me into the studio. And he did. So I spent the first two years with him uh, cleaning. I did a lot of cleaning because he's a mess. I loaded and unloaded kilns. I learned to load bisque kilns. I learned to load gas kilns. And we built a wood kiln the very first year I was with him. And this is our wood kiln. Uh, it's a two chamber Naborigama. This is the view from the firebox. And my, my entry into ceramics was atmospheric, right? And that, that was very exciting. They saw me as useful, right? I could hand bricks. I could follow directions because I had, at this point, five years of a very strict studio setting. I can follow directions, I can clean without messing with your stuff, and uh, I don't talk, right? And, and, and that was me at 15. So Terry really pulled me out of my shell, and we started making pots, and, um, and I started doing production work there. This photo was taken, this is kind of a, a hard one. So there were three potters in that studio and one of them, John Fomich, um, died in a surfing accident. And that doesn't happen in Southern New Jersey, it's not Hawaii, right? Uh, but he just drowned in an accident. And so um, the next day they hired me as a thrower uh, for that studio, uh, it was October 24th. And he was the big pot maker for the studio. So that became an interest and a focus. My job was as a replacement. Uh, we had, and that's when I was given a key, uh, which is crazy when I think about, like I would never give a 16 year old a key to my studio <laughs> right now. And they just like gave me a key and were like, use the kilns, whatever, uh, which is amazing. So uh, I was allowed to make my quote unquote own work at night, and I took over uh, Fomich's craft shows. So I called each show and said, uh, basically, hey, this has just happened, so the person you're expecting to show up can't, can't, won't, he's gone. I'm his replacement in the studio, and I will fill the booth if you'll have me. So I worked really hard. I, uh, I took, basically bought his booth set up from his widow um, by giving money after each show. And that's how I accidentally went into business as a 16-year-old. And I had support that I didn't really know I had <laughs> at the time because I had Terry. And he knew who was going to what shows. And he'd call someone that he you know, trusted and said, hey, this kid's going to be there. Just like check on her, would you? <laughs> you know? And that happened quite a bit. And, now, and I, you know, that's how I got to know the Weaver and the you know, different people at the shows. And I had this adult support system that really took care of me, made sure things were okay, uh, and, and helped me get a career off the ground. So I didn't really want to go to school, and my parents really wanted me to, and, and Terry really wanted me to get a college education. He had dropped out, and he thought that, that it was a very good idea for me to go to a university, and eventually I caved. And I only applied one place, and that was Alfred University. And I said, well, if I get in, I'll go. And if I don't, then you can all just leave me alone, right? Because <laughs> I have my dream job uh, <laughs> as a 17-year-old would think. 
So I got to Alfred, and it was amazing. I did foundations. I was out of clay in school for a whole year because uh, it's a Bauhaus style school. And I went back to all of that drawing that I had done with Patricia, and we ended up, you know, making up and being friends again. Uh, but this is a tile class, and I. I hadn't gotten over, I still haven't gotten over my obsession with the potter's wheel. And you can really see that production mindset, that production work coming into focus here in a sculptural way. So even though this was supposed to be a flat tile class, I made everything on the wheel. You can see the throwing lines. You can see that I'm working with consistency so stuff can fit together. Um, I had a blast. This was all done on a plywood board. This is five feet tall, so this is almost it's not quite as big as you see it, so it would be about, about here. Uh, it was a huge piece, and I just, I loved doing that kind of thing. This is also a glaze experiment where I'm working with three different levels of shininess, right, going from eggshell to high gloss, and I'm making a gradient of gray to black. Obviously, I kind of missed a couple grays in there, uh, but this, this was a piece that when I went back and looked at it, I said, oh, this is drawing and production throwing and pattern making simultaneously, and this really starts to solidify what I loved. Uh, when Katrina hit, the uh, George Orr and Georgia O'Keeffe Museum went on the road, and they sent quite a bit of those George Orr pots to Alfred University for housing. So we had an amazing uh, multi-year show of George Orr work. And this is me trying to figure out what he was doing and how he was doing it. If you don't know who that is, he's the Mad Potter of Biloxi. And uh, that work is, is incredibly modern for being over 100 years old. And he did this controlled collapse that was just fascinating. And I was trying to figure out. There are a couple really lovely examples of that in the Dwight Holland collection, uh, or the Dwight Holland room. I don't know which collection they're from but they are so much more interesting to look at in person than on an image like this. So I was still working, working large, so this piece houses um, 17 cups, and so it's like this big, you know. Uh, I was really interested in that. This is a chemical glaze that I had worked with in the production studio that I uh, gradually took the iron out of. So a chemical is an iron saturate, and you can see the original glaze is on this interior. And then each, each cup has a percentage less of that iron in it until we're getting this interesting blonde, almost celadon, out of it. And I really wanted to make large work still. And that large work kept getting bigger. And I was interested in body scale and how these things might fit into the world. Um, into a home, I was start, at this point I'm starting to think about how am I gonna make a living when I leave school, right? So this is the first half of my senior year. I'm really trying to figure that out. Who buys big pots and how do I find them and how do they work their way into a home? I'm also really interested in glaze chemistry and doing a ton of tests. So all of these, even that bright orange, uh, these are all uh, slips, actually, that I've worked with in salt gas to create color. There's no mason stains. This is what I would call real chemistry. So I'm taking things like iron and rutile and tin and cobalt and playing with what feldspar they're with and how they react to what kind of, what level of reduction, that sort of thing. And then you can see I'm thinking through function. Uh, so this is, this can move and it sits together as a bench and you can see there's a, actually a little um, pocket there for a scoop. Uh, so in my, in my apartment in college I had cat food, rice, and potatoes is what was in these after, after they left this installation. Um, and these are good friends, these are actually, uh, they're both professional ceramic artists now. Uh, so this is, um, Justine Figura, and she runs In Tandem Pottery in uh, Massachusetts. And this is Katie Coughlin, and she's a ceramics professor, I believe, in Wisconsin. 
uh, which is kind of fun that they're in, that they're here. You know, they were my models. I bribed them with hot chocolate. This was my uh, senior show. This was half of my senior show. I did two senior shows because I'm an overachiever. The first one uh, was small pots. It was to make money and get a good crit because I had figured out what the professors were looking for and I wanted that pat on the head. Now I don't think it was such a uh, productive thing, but I did sell almost that entire show which funded uh, the studio, funded me building a, a very small studio after this. These pots were what I wanted to make. So I had a lot of jobs in school. Uh, I was a dishwasher, uh, I worked on a goat farm, um, I did odd jobs where I would like clean out people's garages. I, I uh, packed up professors' kids' rooms was one of the things I did. But my very favorite job in the summertime was I worked on an organic herb farm as a picker. And so I took that experience of working these uh, beautiful plants that were, that were being harvested and processed particularly for the Amish community of the area. Uh, and, and I worked that into the pots with that palette I had been developing. So this is me next to calendula, which is a plant that's really wonderful for the skin. It was my favorite thing to harvest because it's, it sits about here. It's almost shoulder height to me. And, uh, and you pick it and it gets stickier and stickier and stickier until you can't let go of the flower because it's stuck to you. Uh, and I just loved calendula because it was so bright and sunny and it smelled wonderful. Uh, but each one of these is, is a different plant. I don't remember them all. This is Passiflora incarnata, which we have here naturally in North Carolina. It grows as a weed. Um, it's one of our only uh, tropical fruits. I know this one is bone set. I couldn't tell you the rest. <laughs> these did not, I sold one, which is this guy right here. Um, the rest didn't sell and they're sitting in my yard right now. I came to North Carolina about three days after the last image was taken, and I moved down here uh, to a, a dirt floor log cabin studio. Uh, the back part of it was a tool shed, and I used the money from selling my show to uh, basically convert it into a little studio for myself. And uh, this is my ex-husband. And we dug and processed all of our own clay for the first few years. This is uh, the almond clay pond, uh, Mitchfield clay. Here I am processing. So this was our horse trough that we mixed all of the clay. And you can see the different buckets of clay I'm mixing. I'm screening out roots and big rocks. Anything that went through the window screen was small enough to be in a pot was kind of the uh, attitude here. These are our drying racks back here. So those are uh, bed sheets that we got from, you know, probably Goodwill. And we lay out the bed sheets and use a sump pump to take all of this liquid slurry clay and lay it out into those racks. It would take about a week and a half to two weeks uh, to drain and dry. And then that would be put through a de-airing pug mill to get it all the same consistency. And that's the clay we would work with. One of the benefits of going to Alfred University is I got a good education in material. So we had both a, a raw materials class, which is basically clay, and we had a glaze calc class. So I took the information I had from them and started doing my own uh, tests in the local materials. So this is a, uh, a series of kind of uh, bastardized button tests, because I didn't have a button press, but I could make, I could make one with my hands and then uh, you put these in the kiln and see what they do. So each one of these is a, a local raw material. This one right here, you can see it says Mitchfield wood salt. So it was going into a wood salt atmosphere and it's the Mitchfield clay that's being dug right here and that's raw. Uh, Sandy Kalen, who knows? Cameron is a, is a location. Um, Thai clay actually was from Thailand. Richardson was from our property. So. Uh, Terry's Rock was from a friend's property. So we were collecting clays from all over and seeing what they did, how they behaved, if it was appropriate for a glaze or a slip or not at all, right? This was part of finding that out. I have a, I'm two degrees short of a minor in art history. Uh, 
because it just didn't fit that last year, but I love history. And that's one of my connections to Clay, is there's this historical underpinning that when you dig into the catalog of the things that humans have made out of clay, the opportunities are endless. So if you find yourself not knowing what to make in the studio, go to those history books because you can find so many amazing things. And uh, this is an example of a, a North Carolina inspiration. This is an Aladdin's lamp. This was made by someone in the Almond family. And uh, it's a little bit dumpy, it's a little bit weird. It's quick, this is a quick pot. Uh, the handle's out of proportion. I can give a, a terrible crit of this, and I have a s sort of this game I play with myself when I don't like something. I say, how can I make a version that I like? What can I draw from this? What can I pull from this piece uh, to develop an object that I find interesting and compelling? Because there's something here, but I don't quite know what it is. So I started doing that with some of the local pots. And so this is my version of an, an Aladdin's lamp. And I made myself some rules. Um, I kept the trajectory of that spout, which I think is a little bit funny when you're pouring tea. I kept this over the top handle. It's really like flamboyant. Uh, I kept an inset lid, but I changed how it interacted with the body. I gave myself a crisper line. And uh, of course, I added my decoration and a very proud little um, finial on the piece as well. So this was my answer, right? If, you, if something feels weird, why? And can I get my eye to solve it? This is another example. These are really, um, this is in, um, from a Greek perspective, an ampulla, a Roman ampulla, but the, this is actually French, and this was made um, as a medieval uh, gift, essentially. So uh, the earliest tourist industry were pilgrimages. It was really the, f my understanding, the first time that people would leave where they were born, where they lived, and go somewhere else, uh, not because they were running from something, not because they were being forced to do so, not because they were starving in that area, but because they wanted to. And it was the first bit of that exploration happening for kind of an average person. You didn't have to be an explorer to go to Canterbury, right? That's what the Canterbury Tales are about, all of these people coming together from different places. So uh, this would have been, you know, whichever saint uh, it was a, the church was associated with, and it would have been filled with holy water, with blessed water, and you would carry this back, buy it, right? Because this is all a money-making activity as well. Uh, you would take that back to a sick family member or someone you really cared about. That would be their gift from the pilgrimage because they couldn't go on it themselves, right? They were un physically unable. And again, this is kind of an interesting little object. You can see it, the quickness and how it's been made. Those handles are just kind of mushed in. This has probably been pressed into a mold more than likely. Uh, this top part may have been thrown, but maybe not. Uh, I've taken this idea and I've made a modern version for the modern tourists that come to Seagrove. And I've put my own, uh, this is a passion flower interpretation, Passiflora incarnata, onto the surface because it's a local flower. And um, asked myself, how does this fit into a modern house, right? So it's, a, it's kind of a bud vase. And it's, it's an interesting object, but again, I've kept some things, I've kept this sort of articulation in that neck and, and made it more interesting to me. I kept the handles, but I scaled them down. I even doubled them in one case. Um, this doesn't have a foot, so theoretically it would hang. Uh, I added a foot, because I wanted to, and I'm allowed. Uh, and I kept this radial, having a, a radial design on the piece. So. I'm not making reproductions of anything, but when I make pots, I'm drawing from history. I make short, this is my old studio, I make short runs of pots. So like this group of pieces, you can see they're as uh, identical as I was willing to make them in the moment, and they have some variation. Like these overblown knobs, you 
legs are a little different at you if you look at them. And I'm starting from something squatter and coming up to this really proud knob. Um, so I'm assuming what I was doing here was an exercise in how do I want the knob to relate to the form of the pot. This is a, another series that I did. Um, Lectheos, I believe is what they are. They're an oil bottle uh, that, that's coming out of a Greek tradition. And again, you can see they all have some consistency. They all fit into that category, but there's quite a bit of play here. So I've started with the same diameter with the foot um, for the most part. I think this one's a little big. And then I gave myself different pieces for the necks. I challenged myself to create a different way of attaching and a different angle of that attachment for each piece, a different kind of size and length for the handles, and um, a different cup top. So these are, these are four pieces each. So one is the body, two is uh, the neck and shoulder, three is the top, and four is the handle. And working within those parameters, I played with scale and stretching. And then, I do, and then I do funny things like this, right? This doesn't look funny to you, but this is hilarious to me. So uh, there's a form called a Rebecca pitcher, which I'll show you a little later. It's a traditional Seagro form. And then Mark Hewitt makes these um, really uh, traditional big-bellied Devon, Devonshire-inspired jugs. So this is uh, what if a Rebecca pitcher and a Mark Hewitt pitcher had a baby? So that's the question I'm answering here. Because those are two forms that I find really interesting uh, and dynamic, but where do I fall within that? What, what do the pots I'm making look like at this moment? Uh, so this is Passiflora incarnata. This is a, a passion flower. I still go back to that early drawing. This is in ink. You put it on the paper and there it is, right? It takes a level of confidence. I'm literally pulling apart the flower to do this. I'm looking at the parts and pieces. Um, there ought to be an image in between, but I, who knows where it is. And this is the finished ceramic version of that. It's not meant to, you're not meant to recognize it. So much of patterning, so much of, of drawing is the impression that's left on the brain. It's more about maybe the memory of what this, was, what this was like. It has these layers to it. It has a big center in the middle. Um, it's dynamic, it's interesting. I would never have come to this pattern without this flower, right? When you're making things up totally on your own, sometimes they become a bit too generic, and I want to bridge that gap. This is one way I think about patterning. So this is a passion flower um, in the way that it grows. And from a side view, it does not appear to be a pattern. This is one of the more complicated things I'll do. But from a top view, you can tell that it is. This is actually um, a pattern of quarters that's happening. And I like this piece way more from the top than from the side. Uh, so Anyway, that's one way that uh, passion flower has made its way into my patterning. Uh, this is more based on a dahlia, but this is so that if you, if you miss tomorrow, uh, you might get a sense of what I do. So uh, this piece, this is a platter that I visually cut into uh, quarters and then eighths, and then I've built my carved pattern from that sort of net that I've put over the piece. So it's, I think, easier for people to absorb that from this projection because you've all probably cut a pizza. And that's really all I'm doing here. That's the trick. Uh, a lot of people go, how can you make it match all the way around? You cut it like a pizza. Uh, visually, not literally cut it. And then from there, the pattern builds. So you can see there's quite a bit. It's like a spider web under there. And I build that spider web as I build that patterning. This was from my first solo show. So um, this is Cornus Florida, which um, of course uh, is a dogwood, right? And so um, here's the, um, the very formal drawing like I would have done uh, with Mr. Grimley. Here's a layout version, and then here's the actual piece.
that associates with it. This is my old studio. And this is really how I end up making pots quite frequently. I'll do a group, and then they each get their own version of a pattern. Here's my little slip bottles, in case you don't see it tomorrow. I think about the pots from all aspects. So in this case, here's the top view. And this is right out of the kiln. Uh, and so this is how a person will see this piece more than likely, because it's about this big. So it'll end up on a hearth on a floor. And um, the, the carving view, for me, the side view, is going to only be seen at a distance, usually, uh, because they, it will be done well. So these twist pieces, if you follow this line all the way up, you can see how it connects from point to point. And uh, that's one of those little tricks that just takes a long time to, to focus in on. All right. Here is my time lapse. This is the time lapse that I was talking about earlier that I made. Um, so if you were in the room, um, I did a show. Basically, the short story is I did a show. I took a big pot. I've been making big pots for years. But I was in a, in a room with a whole bunch of male big pot makers. There hadn't been a female big pot maker in that particular show, in that room, put up against these people. So I spent the whole show being told, you didn't make that, you're too small, over and over and over and over. And I cried the whole way home. And the result is this. So I made this time lapse of myself making a big pot and decorating it start to finish that I then put on an iPad on a loop in my booth so that I didn't have to have that conversation with every middle-aged white man that walked in, right? And that's, you know, it, it, it was, really t it was really hard on me. But the feedback that led to this was, if, if the customer does not know what you do, that is not their fault. And that was really good feedback for me. So when you're selling work, you're educating people. No matter what, you're telling them what you do, you're telling them how you do it, and um, kind of offering them an experience and a little bit of a, a glimpse into that studio into that practice. Uh, so this is a three-day time lapse. And to give you an idea, there's my dog moving around. Uh, I have strep throat while I'm making this, because that is the reality of um, life sometimes as a potter. So you can see like my cups of tea moving around in the background, <laughs> um, just to keep going. And I'm going to put glaze on it. There I am, glazing. This glaze, you'll notice that it's almost exactly the same color as the floor. That's because the clay that's in the glaze is the same clay that's on the floor. So this is one of the local materials, uh, and this the white is that Mitchfield clay that you saw in the clay pit. So this is all clay that I dug and processed myself. I'm no longer doing that to this level. There's my dog for scale, and because I love him, um, and he was so cute. Uh, and here's a couple other pots. Here's where that contrapposto of a flower starts coming into focus for me, particularly in the one behind it. You can see I'm starting to work with these more um, almost Pennsylvania Dutch patterns. Here they are in a kiln. This was, um, we built this kiln in 2013. So it was 34, it, it is 34 feet long. And it could hold about 20 big pots and around 1,000 small pots. So I also make small pots, right? And I love working in other media. So I built this box, which looks warped from where I am. I don't know if it looks right to you guys. Um, and I built it physically around the teapot and the cup set. And I made these wonderful little slots. And I have a lot of interest in other materials, but my studio practice and the amount of time I have to take to make pots can detract from getting to do these fun little projects. So this was, this was a treat project. I have treat projects. This is a dinnerware set I made for a Thai woman in Chapel Hill. This was very interesting to me. This is, again, I'm using all local material. That was very important to her. And she has an entirely different culinary background than I do. 
The way she wanted her plates and her bowls was specific to the dishes that she makes and serves to her family. And, and I would never want plates this big or bowls that wide or whatever, but we worked together to make things that, that um, honored her culinary traditions. And so this is a helianthus dinnerware set. This is somewhere here in storage. This is the uh, tulipiary I was looking for, uh, ambu tulipiary I was looking for, uh, and this is my inkwell version. So I, was, I am really interested in tulipiaries. They're a historical, really weird historical pot. They're way weirder than these, uh, the original ones. And so um, in like the 1700s, uh, there was this tulip mania that happened, and tulip bulbs became incredibly expensive. There was a bubble, essentially, like we've had in the housing market. There was a bubble on tulip bulbs. And one of the things people did to make money off of this is the ceramic artists made uh, tulip display pots. And they're very, very strange by themselves, and they're amazing when they're full of tulips. So I started asking myself, like, all right, how do I want to approach this with my uh, local pots, local materials, and uh, in some cases, local plants, right? Here's um, uh, an underdeveloped pokeberry with that one <laughs> absolutely wonderful magenta stem. I just love those. Uh, so here we are alone in the pot. This is Bill Jones. Bill is about, to, he was the second apprentice in our studio, and he's about to run the Tennessee, nope, the Township 10, I keep wanting to call it Tennessee 10, like the material. It's not Township 10 residency uh, in Marshall, North Carolina. And so we're really excited he's coming back to the state. Uh, and anyway, that's us loading the kiln. It's a little out of order. And here's the kiln uh, finished being loaded. Big kiln, and here we are firing it. So it had um, 17 holes that had to have wood put in it. So our team was minimum five people. And you can see here we're building a wall of small pots that will essentially act as a bag wall. You can see another wall of small pots way in that background. Here's the kiln at top temperature. So this was what I was working with. This is a person. That's Natalie. She's right there. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, it's about the size of a school bus. This is 34 feet from end to end. Now we're back to tulipiaries. Okay, I was lucky enough to be invited to the uh, Kohila Wood Fire Symposium, which is in Estonia, and I got to go in 2015. And uh, the Kohila Symposium exists partially because of Dwight Holland. Um, he went there and was part of building an Anagama and a Burry Box kiln. I think the Anagama particularly. And so there's a, quite a connection between Estonia and Seagrove. Uh, as a result of this, this also led to Anne Partna, who graduated from here, uh, coming to Seagrove and being a resident there. And she has since set up a pottery studio. Andres Aleki, who's a professional kiln builder, has come and built kilns in the States and um, works between the two. And he was one of the founders of the Kohila Symposium. So here I'm taking um, I got really into the local wildflowers and I was documenting everything that I absolutely could that was blooming at the, at the time that I was there on the property um, of this amazing manor house we were all staying in for this big symposium. And so each one of these pockets is a different flower that was blooming at the time. And it was a fun way to interact with local people because they would tell me their the name in Estonian, which I, you know, I don't know, but then they would give me the translation, like what it would mean. So this one is night and day, and uh, we call it a sweet columbine. So there's, there's some differences there, which is, I thought was really fun. Um, so I would recognize a plant and we would compare, you know, what each other called it. Uh, so it was a good way to enter into that culture because it gave us something to talk about that wasn't the weather or something, you know, something weird. Like they could say, oh, come look at this one. I know where it's blooming. Um, so we did that. So there's, um, I think there's 11 
maybe it's 11 different flowers, and the primary one here, the primary border pattern on the big, big pot piece is uh, the strawberry flower that everyone was keeping an eye on where it was because those were going to be the really wonderful wild strawberries that would exist after I left. And that's part of why I'm very interested in the documentation of flowers. And they kind of confirmed it. So if you've read Michael Pollan's uh, book, um, he's written so many, but uh, this one in particular, I'm going to think of its name, um, is kind of about how flowers have, or plants have worked with us to develop themselves. And so one theory as to why the human eye loves a flower, our brain loves a flower, no matter what culture you're from, is very early humans, if they could identify a plant by the flower and knew that there would be fruit from it in a few months, they could essentially predict the future, right? I, as a human, know that this blackberry, the blackberries are blooming right now, this blackberry flower means a blackberry that I get to eat a month from now. So I need to keep an eye on this plant. And in that way, you could get there, as a human, you could get there before the birds, you could protect it, you could you know, do whatever you needed to do to be the one to get that food. So flowers are a, a symbol of future food, and it's something that has developed in our, in our sort of subconscious that we're attracted to these things. Um, and frequently, although not right now, um, frequently there's a bunch of people wearing it in the audience, and I, I think I have one person wearing floral patterning. Um, so it comes up in so many historical places. I also then uh, got to be part of the Young Wood Fire Symposium in Denmark, in Gulliagard, which is accessible to all of you. That's a place where you could go uh, as an assistant or as an artist, um, depending on the amount of time you want to be there and the amount of money you have to spend. So um, I also went and documented flowers there. This one was particularly interesting to me. This is what we would call a bachelor's button. Uh, they had a much larger white variation of this. Uh, the blue version is the national flower of Estonia. So everywhere I went that that was blooming, someone told me that in Estonia. Uh, and the fun thing, <laughs> the really kind of fun and funny thing about my time in Denmark was um, the entire permanent staff of Gulligard got the flu. And so it was just us and the assistants, and all of the assistants were Estonian friends um, that I had met at the Kohila Symposium. So uh, we just had the run of the place because the, the adults were gone, right? Uh, so we fired five kilns in five weeks, all wood kilns. Uh, we fired um, an, a little anagama built by Andres Aliki. We fired the round uh, Olsen cross draft church kiln they call the Embla. We fired a converted gas kiln that got converted to wood, which was very interesting. And we fired a train kiln twice. Uh, and we cleaned everything really well. And when, when the people in charge got back, they were very pleased. So <laughs> it, it worked out. Uh, but th this was a wonderful residency. And you can see, here's, here's my collection of flowers that I'm about to deal with in the background. Um, oh, here, this is where that was supposed to be. So this is, this is the Embla. This is the um, Olsen cross draft kiln that you can find in the Olsen kiln book. Uh, this is Sten. He was probably uh, my highlight of this symposium. Um, Sten has since passed away, but he was um, a deaf and mostly mute Danish artist who spent a period of time at Gulligard every year. And uh, he could read lips in Danish, but not in English. So he communicated with us English speakers entirely through gesture. And he put a lot of effort into getting to know each one of us. I was in charge of firing the Embla. We each kind of formed teams to be in charge of each kiln, and I, um, I took on the Embla, and um, Perry Haas was my like call a friend, fix it, because he was the last person to fire it, and it was three years before. So the only other person, the only person present that had ever fired that kiln was Sten. So Sten and I had to work together 
with this paperwork that was half in Danish, half in English, some of it was in Estonian, uh, with Fahrenheit and Celsius, and we couldn't speak the same language, and it all had to be through gesture, and it was the most amazing experience that I've ever had, because um, he got his point across a lot, and the, m the main one was kaboom, right? He was very, very worried we were gonna blow this kiln up, and you can see we filled it full of big pots. This is um, Levi, Mahan, and I unloading. Um, I uh, sort of funnily ended up there with my neighbor from Seagrove completely unintentionally. Uh, we got there and went, oh, hi. Um, but luckily we're friends, so it was okay. Uh, you can see here's some of the big pots. We each taught a different thing while we were there. Um, we had a, a slip caster, but he decided to teach beer making. Um, Levi, who's a, a generational potter out of Seagrove, taught rope making for, you know, texture in your clay, right? I taught big pots. So we made big pots and we filled the embla. And th this was from our show in the end. So uh, it was a great experience and I do recommend that, that uh, residency. And um, like I got back from that and I bought an abandoned building. So this is the Triangle Service Station. It had been empty for 35 years at, at this moment, right? It's very sad. This is a very sad building. I showed a picture of it to my mother before I bought it, and she said, it's really ugly. <laughs> I was like, it has potential, Mom. Um, so this is, this is a before, and this is after. So Aaron Young, who's a graduate um, of ECU, and I teamed up and decided to save this building, right? Neither of us had a whole lot of experience in any of that, but we both had a really good freshman foundations course. So we knew we could do it out of, you know, material from dumpsters, basically. And that's what we did. These windows took three weeks to rehab. Just themselves. Uh, and then there's some things that we didn't get to. So this is another one of those windows. Um, and it was boarded up initially. I've left it boarded up and I painted on it instead. These are all sample colors from picking for the gallery and the bathroom and the studios and all that. And I mixed them and I just had fun with it. Uh, so part of being an artist is, I would say, sacrifice, right? I have plenty of good friends and family members and people in my life um, that have salaried jobs and they can tell you how much they made this year and how much they expect to make next year. Uh, their lives have a structure to them that is imposed from the outside. I don't have any of that. Um, I just did taxes so I can tell you how much I made this year. Next year is a mystery. I have goals and uh, I work very hard to meet those goals, but they don't always happen and life is a bit more fluid. I bought this building instead of a house because I decided to put an emphasis on making work. Uh, particularly at this point in my life, I should be um, very far away from my prime but working hard towards it while I don't have a lot of responsibilities. So I, um, I ended up divorced and essentially homeless. Um, so this was supposed to be my office slash clean studio for painting, printmaking, and uh, any fiber work I want to do. It's a fantasy still. Um, instead, it's where I live. So this is, this is my house um, right before I moved in. So I've got my little bookshelf, and that's my bed. And I have a planter here that I do have plants in. My, uh, I'm most proud of the staircase. So cubbies for shoes of different heights, right? I have a place for boots place for real tall boots. Um, these two, actually three, are boxes. So my sewing machine is in this one. It's the deepest one. Uh, this one holds all of the other sewing supplies. This one has the dog treats. Uh, and then these this tall part here, if you go around the corner, that's my hanging closet under that. So, you know, Clay has taught me to improvise and work on my feet. This post was part of the parking situation out front, so I, um, it was bright yellow. I sanded all of that off and painted it, and now it's the bed support. I drilled through the wall, through the 11-inch thick brick wall, 
to mount this uh, to mount this bed. This is an old booth that I've taken apart and remade um, into a queen size bed because I'm giving myself what I've always wanted, right? <laughs> um, so a nice big bed, uh, and this is uh, 11 and a half foot ceilings. The dresser was in the building. The building was full of junk. Uh, I kept the dresser. This is a little fold out desk. Um, if you turn around, then you see it, in this space, you would see the kitchen. But that's where I live now, which is in the building in the back of the gallery. It's completely illegal, right? I don't put this, I, if I'm doing a slide lecture for the public, this is not included. But it, sometimes you have to do these things. It depends on what you want, what's important to you. And I decided that it was more important to me to keep this building and turn it into a functional studio space and gallery than it, than it was to live in a house. So this is, this is my studio mid-construction. Uh, you can see I've got a wheel under there, uh, but there's all my scrap boards. I, may, I built just about everything out of scrap cedar from a local furniture maker. So a lot of it, like particularly this board, you can see is kind of eaten up. Um, it's not a, a full hard board. It doesn't need to be. There's buckets on the other side of that, right? This is kind of an aesthetic front in a way. Um, this is my wonderful table I was talking about that pulls out into the room on casters. This is my big pot bench right here. I now have small pot shelving there. So here's a more finished studio, the, um, cat for scale. These are the first big pots made in this space. This is a Dutch door that I built that I really love and I'm super proud of. There's my big pot bench again. You can see clay storage. Um, there's Piggy the pug mill. This is my favorite piece of equipment. This is the gallery. Uh, after I bought the space, but after I spent quite a bit of time cleaning it, I power washed this building inside and out. I spent about two months soaking wet one summer just washing the building because it had been a service station, uh, so everything was covered in a layer of grease. And I thought I was going to scrub that grease up by hand and I spent one day trying that and I said, I need a better solution. So I got a biodegradable degreaser and uh, a sprayer and I would spray and then uh, power wash. And I had, to do, I had to do everything twice. Here's after. So um, this is the other side of that little mural. Uh, and then pieces that I got at flea markets. Uh, this is a counter for a kitchen that a friend ripped out. Um, each of these doors is different if you focus in on it, which I think is great. Uh, so anyway, this is the gallery uh, shortly after opening. There's another gallery view. Those are those wonderful windows. We talked about community earlier. One of the reasons I've been able to do this are the other potters in the area. This is Ben Owen. He's, uh, he's also an ECU graduate, right? He came here. And, uh, Ben has been kind enough to let me fire large work with him. Uh, Jim and I were talking about moving um, greenware, right? It's scary when you're moving a greenware vase that's, you know, huge. Um, so I've been doing that and that's kept me in business and it's kept me in making big pots. This is my kiln now. Uh, it's a little, I, I lovingly call it my trash can kiln. So everything here is reclaimed material from the burners to the brick, to even the hose on those burners. Uh, the, the kiln stack actually uh, was in the building when I bought it. It was kind of a dump site for another potter, so I got some things out of that, uh, one of the Von Cannons. And uh, what I figured out, when you look at these and look at the specs, there's a whole book about these. It doesn't include a chimney. And I have gotten so much more control over this kiln by uh, making a three layer stack of brick chimney. It's really kind of incredible. These are an easy accessible kiln for you to build, right? It's just an electric kiln with the elements ripped out and hooked up to gas. And these are natural uh, propane venturi burners. It's a natural draft venturi. So the only thing I had to pay for here was the hookup to my propane. And you can see I've got two more um, stacked up in the back because when people found out I was doing this, they gave me their trash. They said, here are some kilns 
that are no longer functional, uh, and it saved them a, a trip to, to the dump. Um, so here's a, here's a big pot coming out of it. I can do one little big pot, uh, <laughs> and I was so pleased to be able to fire one on my own. Uh, and these, these pots are out of Anne Parchena's wood kiln at Blue Hen Pottery. So this is some of the results I'm getting from that. You can see the patterning has really shifted. I started working with a peony pattern from, um, oh, originally it was a drawing I did from a 14th century pillow that I saw in a museum. And that has kind of developed into other things. So kind of a night blooming cirrus is happening here. Um, this is more, these two are more close to that original peony pattern. And I started playing with the chemistry. So the, this, this slide isn't super blue, but this background actually is a very dark cobalt blue, which you haven't seen in earlier slides. Um, and then I also have this um, uh, celadon that's giving iron crystals, uh, which is pretty interesting. So I have bear clay, this one's bear clay, and this one has those crystals, that crystal growth. Making a business work sometimes isn't fun. So I got a commission, um, I agreed to a commission for a candle company where I made uh, 300 candle holder boxes, lidded, lidded, knobbed candle holder boxes. They were all carved, all had to be the same pattern. So uh, three different sizes. <laughs> it was torture. Uh, and I've just, I, I finished it about a year ago and I've just made the first boxes I'm willing to make for myself like three weeks ago. So uh, taking commission work is one part of the puzzle piece of making a living. You don't always get to make what you want to make. So having that balance between um, making money and making sure the commission pushes you forward in some way. This was for a very high-end candle company. Uh, this has not dropped yet. So. Again, I can't put this out to the general public, actually. I have a, um, a, a DNA, uh, do not disclose, non-disclosure agreement. Uh, so um, anyway, sometimes you do those things, and it's good. It was very good for me. Um, I also have done a uh, backsplash most recently, so I do tile work some, and you can see how I've developed that pattern making into tile. I did um, maybe inadvisable things like cut the plugs out because then there's a lot of math to making that shrinkage work. And uh, this is actually coming up uh, to the left of a stove. This is then going to be the background for a stove and it'll step back down. It was a really complicated, time consuming piece and I actually had to make it twice because I overfired the kiln the first round. So sometimes you also have terrible disasters. Uh, this is Allison, she's one of my current assistants and she used to be a clay maker at Starworks and she's really fantastic and is leaving me in July. This is some of her work here. I actually had to close the gallery and um, use the gallery space to lay out this tile to make sure I had everything where it was supposed to be and documented for the tile setter. Uh, and here's, here's that plug finished, I'm quite proud of it. Um, I wish I had a finished image of the kitchen, but I haven't put it in yet. Uh, another thing I've done, I've worked with um, a design company uh, out of High Point. So High Point has the furniture market, and uh, this is a design build firm that uh, was making planters, and they were going to, they are uh, making uh, cement versions. So I was making the initial prototype for them to then make a cast off of, and um, press, essentially press mold planters. So um, here uh, Justin's sitting on my original, and which is bisque fired, and these are some color tests that he's done, and you can see there's some making issues that we're talking through with the mold. Is it how I really want to spend a day? Not really, but it's kind of interesting. And he's an engineer, he's not an artist, but pretty much everybody else there is an artist. Um, so it's interesting, right? And this is what uh, this is a good image of what my work looks like now, and what um, maybe a promotional image might be for a kiln load. This was probably taken by Erin Young. I know it was taken by Erin Young. Uh, she's doing most of our images, and um, 
PR work and social media and all that. So anything that you see for the triangle, um, she's got a hand in. And because we're working together, right, I'm running the day-to-day -day gallery stuff. I'm making sure we've got trash bags and toilet paper and somebody uh, answering the door and the phone. Uh, I'm running that side of thing, the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts side, and she's running that promotional side. Um, here are some of those Rebecca pictures. So this is me playing. Uh, this is kind of a traditional Rebecca, and then I have uh, an in-between, and this is more based on what I believe is the form that the Rebecca was based on that's actually Greek, which I cannot pronounce. Oh, and I do printmaking sometimes for fun. Uh, so this is me working through some ideas. Uh, this print is about this big, and um, anyway, sometimes I have fun in the studio and I do other things. And this is now a sticker. So I did my print, and then I scanned that, and I shrank it, and I made stickers, because why not? Uh, and this is me with some big pots at my old studio um, for scale, and because that's what I looked like 10 years ago. And that's the end. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to take questions. It's okay if you don't have any. That's fine. You can talk to me tomorrow. Okay. Three minutes over. Okay. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Stunned silence, is yeah. that? <laughs> okay. You can feed me leftovers again, I'm happy. <laughs>